Welcome to our seventh forum of the Renaissance Society fall semester. Today's presentation is Dr. Charlie Bamforth, Beer Looks Good, Tastes Good, and Does You Good. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on in the Renaissance YouTube channel. This forum is being presented as a webinar, not a meeting. You will be muted with no video. While the chat feature is not available, you will have the opportunity to submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. The questions will be gathered and at the end of the presentation, Dr. Bamforth will provide answers as the time allows. Now on to the presentation. Dr. Charlie Bamforth has been a part of the brewing industry since 1978. Formerly with the Brewing Research Foundation and Bass in the UK, he was the lead professor of brewing at UC Davis for 20 years, starting in 1999. He is a distinguished professor emeritus at UC Davis and is also an honorary professor with the University of Nottingham in England, as well as senior quality advisor to Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. He is the author of numerous articles, papers and books on beer and soccer, has been featured extensively in the media and has received many awards for his contributions to the industry. Before I invite him to speak, let's find out a little bit about how you all feel about beer with a poll. So there are three questions in this poll. So if you need to see all three, make sure you, you scroll down. So I'm going to go ahead and read them so they have we have them as part of this recording. If you were allowed just one of these beers, what would it be? Pilsner, Pale Ale, Stout, Hefeweizen, Barley Wine, Sour Beer, or I don't drink beer. And we're going to give you about a minute to answer these questions. The second question is, have you ever brewed your own beer? Yes or no? And the question number three, how long does it typically take to brew beer? Choose one. I see that we now have one third of our group have voted and is climbing up. Looks like the beers are pretty popular except for barley wine and sour beer. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap the polling up in about a minute or in a, in a couple seconds. So we can get those in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results. It's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Bamforth to review the poll and captivate us with his discussion on beer. Thank you, Laurie. It's very nice to be here and uh, some interesting results there. I'm pleased to see the pale ale is right up there. Um, and you, I agree with you in terms of the sour beer. Lots of people love sour beer, but, but not me. Disappointed to see 12% don't drink beer, but um, there's probably some very good reasons for that. Uh, have you ever brewed beer on your own? 84% uh, of people say no. Uh, I Neither have I. Um, I always say, though, if I was a brain surgeon, I wouldn't go home and operate on my wife. So I'd leave the day job. Uh, leave it to the professionals is what I say. And how long does it typically take to brew beer? Yeah, it's closer to one month than any of the other times. Certainly not one day. Uh, one week will be very, very quick. Uh, one year, depends whether you would include the growing of the barley or not but uh, about a month, it's a long and uh, loving process. So let's, uh, let's talk about uh, beer. And uh, uh, let's bear in mind that uh, beer has been around for uh, a very long time. And it's been an integral part of the history of this great country. Um, the Pilgrim Fathers uh, on Mayflower left Plymouth, England on September the 6th, 1620 disembark Plymouth Rock, December 26, 1620, our victuals being much spent, especially our 
beer. They'd run out of beer, actually not entirely. There was enough for the sailors to go back to England. Uh, and they uh, settled in Plymouth Rock or arrived in Plymouth Rock because one of the main reasons they ran out of beer. And beer has been very, very popular in the world now for a very long time, probably about 8,000 years. And uh, it's, it's not always easy to get the most recent data, but uh, 2015 is not a million miles different from what it will be now in that the number one uh, uh, grow, uh, production location for beer is China. Uh, they produce a lot more beer than anywhere else in the world. Uh, that's because there's a very large number of Chinese people. If you went back uh, 30, 40 years, you'll find the volumes were an absolute minuscule fraction of that. So it's been a huge growth in, in the market, the business in China. Uh, in terms of consumption, they don't drink uh, too many liters per head. The United States is number two. Brazil is number three. That's one of the markets where it's actually growing. If you were to consider who are the uh, most uh, consuming of beer, the, the uh, country where they drink the most beer, then that would be the Czech Republic, where they drink 143 liters per head per annum. Uh, they don't produce very much because it's not a very big country, but they sure like to drink their beer. Following them, apart from Germany, we have, of course, near neighbor Austria. Now, the world of brewing is uh, divided up these days into the very, very large and the very, very small. And easily the largest brewing company in the world is AB InBev, Anheuser-Busch InBev. Uh, InBev acquired Anheuser-Busch several years ago. And uh, even more recently, AB InBev acquired the second biggest brewing company in the world, SAB Miller, South African breweries Miller. The Miller Park, of course, coming from Milwaukee, the South African breweries coming from Johannesburg, but SEB Miller actually was headquartered in London. So it was technically a British company. So the very largest company bought the next largest company for the simple reason that they wanted to get into Africa. What it meant was they had uh, rather too much of a monopoly. Um, and all these beers that uh, came together, the AMB InBev uh, portfolio of products, which included not only the famous Budweiser and Stella Artois, but uh, beers, for example, from my old company, Bass um, and Whitbread and uh, certain others. Uh, SAB Miller, of course, had the Miller brands and, uh, and, and, and so on. So they had to uh, divest. And uh, the Miller brands basically were sold to Molson Coors. Molson Coors in itself has been a, a merger between the Canadian company Molson and the famous company from Golden, Colorado, who until relatively recently had the single biggest brewery in, uh, in the world. Not the single biggest brewing company, but the single biggest brewery in Golden. Uh, some of the uh, other beers, the Grosch and the Peroni from Italy, uh, that they were sold to Asahi. Asahi, the largest brewing company in Japan these days, making big inroads into Europe and into the United States of America. At the other extreme, of course, we have the so-called craft brewing industry. I personally don't like the term craft because as far as I'm concerned, all brewers are craftspersons, no matter on what scale they brew. The Brewers Association, based in Boulder, Colorado has tried to define exactly what a craft brewery is, and they define it as small. And their definition of small is an annual production of less than 6 million barrels of beer per year, uh, which is about 3% of the total sales of the United States of America. 6 million still seems a very, very large number to me. Um, and uh, it's equivalent to, to the output of Ireland or the output of Denmark. Um, and I think the reason they do it is to keep the Boston Beer Company in the club. Um, the Boston Beer Company, Sam Adams, they produce considerably less than that, but uh, they continue to grow and they'd like to keep them part of the club. Uh, actually, they made one or two other changes to the uh, rules and regulations, which actually meant uh, that uh, Boston Beer Company had their nose pushed out, as we'll see in a moment. But uh, the, the, the sheer interest in beer uh, means these days that there's a huge number of brewing companies in the United States of America. If you go back to 1873, there were a lot, 4,131. And then, of course, there was consolidations and mergers and acquisitions and some companies developing bigger and bigger breweries. 
uh, shipping the beer bigger and bigger distances. So this consolidation took it down to 1,733. And then we had that uh, bizarre episode of prohibition, which technically speaking meant uh, in 1923, zero. And then some companies survived. Uh, so by 1943, we got back up to 491, then still more mergers and consolidations led us down to 173. And finally in 1983, the year I joined Bass, down to just 93 separate breweries in the United States of America. And then, of course, J Jimmy Carter signed uh, the legislation, which meant that uh, home brewing became legal at the federal level. And lots of people who had been brewing at home illegally uh, were now able to come out of the closet, literally, and uh, develop their own brewing companies. So by 2019, we're up to 8,386. COVID is going to radically change that. Uh, not everybody is going to survive. Um, so I expect those numbers to go down. But you can see just how amazing uh, it is in terms of the interest in beer across this nation. So if we go back to the largest uh, brewing company in the craft brewing club, it's Yingling from Pottsville in Pennsylvania. Uh, Yingling, the oldest brewery in the United States of America. And of course, if you know anything about the Yingling portfolio of beers, then they're, they're not of the style, originally, certainly, um, that uh, you would associate with what people perceive as being craft brews. But nonetheless, they fulfill all the criteria to be a craft brewer. So that pushed the Boston Beer Company from Massachusetts into second place. And of course, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company is number, th uh, number three. Now, as you've heard, I am associated with Sierra Nevada, and I'm very proud to, to be so because I consider the brewery in Chico to be the second most beautiful brewery uh, in the world. And if you want to know where the most beautiful brewery in the world is, it's North Carolina near Asheville. Um, and that is, of course, the other brewery of the Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. Now, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in acquiring some of these com companies. I don't, I really don't expect Sierra Nevada to be acquired by anybody. Uh, but some others have. So Craft Brew Alliance these days is very much part of AB InBev. Lagunitas is 100% owned by Heineken. And the Anchor Brewing Company is owned by Sapporo from Japan. And a lot of people, as soon as the companies get acquired, they start saying, well, the beer is rubbish now and it's, it's not the same. That's not true. That's just not true. Um, yeah, there, is, there are arguments against the very, very large brewing companies. Um, but in the, some of the strengths are that they really, really do bring uh, good systems and good quality principles into play. So what are the four basic ingredients of, of making beer? Well, the four main ones are malted barley, hops, yeast, and water. And in Germany, according to Reinheitsgebot of 1516, uh, that's all you can use. The, the so-called purity law uh, means that beer should be made just from these uh, raw materials. Of course, uh, across the world, a lot of great beers are made with what we call uh, some adjuncts. So the main uh, raw material, grist material is, uh, is nearly always malt, but there can be some other materials used as well. You'll have heard of the famous Trappist beers. Uh, they have some sugar in there that comes from uh, sugar beet. It's called candy sugar. And uh, everybody would agree that uh, the Trappist beers are, uh, are fine products. And of course, uh, rice, the single biggest use for rice in the United States of America is in the production of Bud and Bud Light. It's 70% malt and 30% rice, not because it's cheaper, but to actually give a lighter color and a lighter flavor. Um, so let's briefly go through the process, which as we've established is uh, fairly uh, prolonged. Uh, and we start for most beers with barley. Uh, now, of course, there are some beers that uh, are primarily based on uh, wheat, but barley is uh, the main raw material for making beer. And one of the reasons for that is on the outside of the barley, there's a husk. And that husk, which you don't find on things like wheat, uh, forms a filter bed in the brew house. Now, barley is hard and it's tough. We're talking about the grain now, the seed, if you like. It's hard and it's tough. And to get it into a form where you can brew with it, you have to malt it. And this takes place in the malt house. Uh, the number one growth location for barley in the United States of America is Idaho. 
So in the malt house, it has to be steeped in water for a couple of days. Then it's got to be germinated for four or five days to uh, soften the grain, to develop the enzymes, which are going to be used in the brew house to break down the starch. And then finally, it's dried again. It's kilned to lower the moisture and to stabilize the grain. And uh, we'll come back to the malt in a little while. So the malt then has to be stored. It has to be stored for a while, actually. And in fact, uh, traditionally, it's stored for four weeks. So there's a month straight away. And if you don't do that, uh, then uh, you can't process the grain. It, it doesn't have, perform well in the brew house. So then it's ground up, it's milled in, uh, in the brewery to form small particles which are readily extracted. And here we add water. So the water is added to make this uh, kind of porridge, this mash. And this is the stage um, at which you break down the starch to produce fermentable sugars. This takes about an hour. And then you separate the, uh, the liquid, which is now called sweet wort. You separate it from the spent grains in the separation stage. Those spent grains usually go up to dairy uh, herds, cat cattle, um, so cows love spent grains. And then the wort is boiled for about an hour with hops. This is how beer saved the world, because for thousands of years our ancestors drank water and they didn't know it had pathogens in it and they sort of turned up their toes and didn't survive very long. But when you boil the wort, you kill off the pathogens. So this is basically how beer allowed civilization to survive. And it's at this stage traditionally where you add the hops, of which more uh, momentarily. After about an hour or so, now you're going to clarify the word. You're going to remove the uh, precipitate that is formed during boiling, which you want to get rid of. And then it's cooled down. And uh, now you're going to add the yeast to the pitching word. So this is yeast, a single celled organism, uh, the world's favorite fungus, a microscopic fungus. And it will now ferment and it will multiply. These cells will divide about three times and you'll produce more yeast but more importantly you'll produce beer. That surplus yeast can go to pig food. Um, if you're English uh, it goes to Marmite which you either love or hate depending on whether your mother uh, sullied your toast with it as a child. Um, my mother didn't. I hate Marmite. My wife loves Marmite. So after about uh, oof, anything from as short as three days of fermentation to as long as two weeks. Now you have various ranges of uh, stages of conditioning for different periods of time. Some people are very traditional. They take several weeks over this. And then finally, there may be filtration and stabilization. And finally, packaging. Packaging is the most uh, demanding and expensive start the stage in your uh, whole operation. For many beers, the package is the most expensive part of the uh, product and it may be canned at 2,000 cans a minute or bottled at 1,200 bottles a minute or kegs or if you're a serious drinker into a truck. So if you look, consider the, uh, the grain, um, there are different types of malt. The workhorse malt is this one, we see it at about two o'clock, that's the pale malt. It's been dried fairly gently uh, to develop a little bit of colour uh, and uh, but uh, to ensure that the enzymes survive, which are needed to break down the starch, particularly in the brew house. And you get the sort of mellow biscuity flavor. Um, if you've ever tasted cornflakes, they don't taste of corn, they taste of malt and because they, they spray some malt on as a source of color and flavor onto the cornflakes. And there's the wheat malt. So if you're making a wheat-based beer, you'll have wheat malt, but you'll always have some pale malt uh, to provide the husk. Then if you have more and more color uh, heating, then you get more and more color and more and more flavor. So caramel malt, you imagine that's giving you the toffee sort of flavors and caramelized flavors. But the more you heat, the more you kill off the enzymes. So if you want to make a, a, a somewhat darker ale, maybe a, a, a darker pale ale, you'll primarily have pale malt, but you'll have some of these caramel malts as well, lighter or darker caramel malts, a smaller percentage to give more flavor and color. If you're making a porter, then you're gonna be putting in some chocolate malt. Again, your main malt is the pale malt, but you'll be adding some chocolate malt. And chocolate malt uh, is produced on a roasting drum. So you go from the kiln, you go to the roasting drum. Uh, so you really roast the grain. 
And a good example is roast barley. Some of you will like Guinness. Guinness contains some roasted barley. And that's, that gives the sort of the burnt, harsh character. Uh, a woman emailed me some while ago and said, is it true the difference between Guinness brewed in Dublin and Guinness brewed elsewhere in the world is they marinate a dead cow in the beer in Ireland? So I emailed back and told her how stupid she was. It was a sheep. Um, but uh, I, I was joking. That's just that's just a joke. Um, actually, in Guinness, they put nitrogen gas into the kegged and the canned uh, Guinness. Uh, that is to uh, improve the foam stability, but it also softens the palate. And that's why some people have cold uh, dispensed coffee um, under nitrogen to to uh, smooth out that, uh, that some of the more harsh characters. So I call I call uh, the malt the soul of the beer, the, the main grist material that's going to be milled. Then we have the hops, uh, the flowering body of the female um, of the species. There are male hop plants and there are female hop plants, but uh, usually they're kept apart because if they party and they uh, interact, you're going to get seeds and that's generally not considered to be good for quality. Uh, the uh, hops, of course, Sacramento used to be very important hop grown, growing region. These days, by far and away, the biggest growth location in the world is Yakima in Washington state. The next biggest location in the states is uh, in Oregon, but it's a long way behind uh, Washington state in terms of uh, quantities. The hops provide the resins, and this is the source of the bitterness, uh, but the uh, hops also provide the oils, and it's the oils that give the aroma. Um, so most of the hops traditionally are put into the kettle boil, and when you boil, you extract the bitterness. But when you want to really put a lot of hop aroma into a product, you add hops to the finished beer, and then you're not extracting the bitterness as much as you're extracting all of this aroma. Uh, and so some of you will have heard of a beer called Torpedo from Sierra Nevada. It's called a Torpedo because the hops are packed into a, a vessel that is shaped like a torpedo and the beer is pumped through the hops over several days to extract lots and lots of these oils which give those fruity and citrus and piney and spicy characters and of course lots of different hop varieties uh, that give different types of aroma. The closest relative of the hop is of course marijuana. Uh, several years ago now that I was up in Humboldt County giving a presentation, it's the only time in my life when the audience stepped out halfway through for a weed break. Yeast. There are two main types of brewing yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is ale yeast. And there you can see it budding. This is the daughter cell, which is, which is budding off. Uh, as you can see on the right side, hand side, it will grow to identical to the mother cell and then will give her another cell. So it multiplies by binary fission. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae is uh, ale yeast. Saccharomyces pastorianus is lager yeast. Now you can go all over the world and you can isolate um, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae. Uh, ale yeast, but you can't isolate Saccharomyces pastorianus from nature. It arose in a brewery or a laboratory sometime by two yeasts melding together. One was Saccharomyces cerevisiae and one was a wine yeast called Saccharomyces eubionus. And they merged together to give a, if you like, a super yeast with 50% more DNA. So it's very unusual. Uh, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae for ales, usually fermenting at higher temperatures, and Saccharomyces pastorianus, which prefers lower temperatures, uh, that is what is used for uh, lagers. So the fundamental difference between an ale and a lager is which yeast is used. Is it Cerevisiae or pastorianus? Now, of course, for most beers, the number one component is water. Most beers are at least 90% water. So you've got to get it right. And not only is the water used to go into the beer, but also, of course, it's, got, it's needed for cooling and heating. Uh, we heat vessels with steam uh, produced by boiling the, the water. Uh, it's used for cleaning. So a really good brewery will use about three barrels of water for every barrel of beer. And brewers are very conscientious about trying to minimize their water usage. Uh, what they don't usually tell you is you need a heck of a lot more water to grow the crops. 
uh, than you will actually use in the brewery. Now the water is very important, the composition of the water is very important, the salts, the hardness of the water, the level of calcium in the water. And the two main extremes are for the softest water, Pilsen in the Czech Republic, which has very, very soft water, and Burton-on-Trent, where I used to be based in England with Bass, which has got phenomenally hard water. It's about 10 times harder than the water here in Davis. And people moan about the water in Davis for being hard. It's 10 times harder in Burton-on-Trent. And the ions, the calcium and so on, influence the performance, the process, and the product. Now, not all beers are 90% plus water because there's a war going on for who can come up with the most alcoholic beer. So uh, the more alcohol, the less water. And this war started in uh, uh, Boston with Sam Adams' Utopias. In 2002, it was 24% ABV, alcohol by volume. By 2007, 27%. And the war went to Europe between the Germans and the British, which, of course, uh, there's a long history of that. And uh, Schorschbrau came out with Schorschbock in February 2009, 31% alcohol by volume. And there's only one way to do that. And the Canadians have known this for years. You take your beer, you stick it in the snow, of which there are large quantities in Canada. And the first thing to freeze out is pure water. So you concentrate the product. And this is how they make these products. Over to Scotland, a company called Brewdog, and they came out, came out with Tactical Nuclear Penguin, 32% alcohol. Tactical to attack the Germans, nuclear, because it was 32% alcohol uh, by volume, and Penguin, because of the ice. Back to Germany, and I'm not sure what they said, but uh, Martin Himmel probably came into it, and they came out with Schorzbach 40. Yeah, yeah, this will show them. Well, it didn't, because... Uh, uh, Brewdog came out with a product, 41% alcohol, and called it Sink the Bismarck. That went down well. And then uh, they surpassed themselves still further with a product which was 55% alcohol by volume. They call it the end of history, which is what it is if you drink it, and every bottle is inserted into a stuffed animal. And I believe these are selling on eBay for several thousand pounds. And I have to ask myself, why? So the complex, the, the flavor of beer is extremely complicated. An ex expert uh, taster of beer uh, can score uh, the beer flavor using many terms. We put them into a wheel and we can divide them into taste and odor. I hate the word odor. The uh, wine guys are much smarter. They use the term aroma or bouquet, but brewers have used the word odor. Um, so there are a limited number of tastes, the sweet, salt, sour, and bitter, but there's mouthfeel, the texture of the product. Things like the carbonation gives you the tingle, the sparkle. The CO2, the carbon dioxide, is detected by your pain mechanism in, on your palate, the same mechanism that detects chili peppers. That's how you detect carbonation. <clears throat> but nitrogen, a little bit of nitrogen gas, gives you a much smoother flavor. But the vast majority of the flavor is detected by the nose. Um, so this is why it's so important that you, first of all, pour the beer into a glass so you can smell the beer. But then when you drink it, you get a second bite of the, the, the cherry, if you pardon the expression, because the, uh, when you swallow, the aroma also comes back up through the back of the throat through the so-called retronasal effect. <clears throat> so if you drink your beer, you pinch your nostrils shut with a closed pin or something, you won't taste very much at all. Most of it uh, comes uh, from um, substances you detect through the nose. And there are a great many of these giving all sorts of flavors, um, uh, which you can see some of them here. And I'll mention them, some of them briefly uh, uh, today. Now, of course, there are many different beer styles. And I've told you the fundamental difference in a lager and an ale. So there are many different lagers. And I, on this plot, I've, I've um, plotted them out. It, it balanced hoppiness, balanced against maltiest, maltiness and fullness and so on. And of course, we're all familiar with the, the classic American light beers, the, the Buds, the Bud Lights, the, the, the Millers, the Coors and so on. And don't, don't let anybody tell you anything other than the fact they are great beers. Um, they're remarkably consistent and they're very hard to make. 
for the simple reason that you can't disguise any mistakes. When I was teaching at UC Davis and we had brewing competition, nobody ever tried to make a bud because they knew they couldn't. It's very, very hard to do it consistently well. And, you know, I hate it when people sort of rubbish these beers and rubbish people who drink them because there's a hell of a lot of people do drink them and enjoy them. And that's OK. It doesn't make you a bad person. Uh, but of course, there are many beers in the world, any lagers with with more full, fullness of character. Pilsner, of course, traditionally for the Czech Republic, but also German Pilsners. They tend to be fairly malty, but they do have a subtle hop character as well. More so than a Merzen, which is more about the malt, as is the Hellas and the Dunkel. Hellas means pale. The word hell means pale. So this is a, a sort of a golden lager. Uh, the Hellas is the kind of the workhorse lager style beers you're going to get if you go to Germany. Box tend to be fuller, uh, more alcohol, strength, strength. And that's why there's often a goat on the, the label as an, uh, a symbol of, of, of strength. And even more so, Doppelbock. Uh, with a lot of multi character and, and uh, uh, some oomph. But the thing is, if you, you sort of plot a line, you can see it's a straight line. The, the point there is it's balance. What you've got to have with a flavor, uh, with flavor for a beer, a good beer, is a balance between the maltiness and the hoppiness. You don't have to have a huge multi character or indeed a huge hoppy character. You can have middle of the road sorts of characters. You can have bigger beers, and that's okay, but they've got to be balanced. And when it, we come to ales, then we have the fairly low alcohol Weisse beer. Uh, Napoleon called it the Champagne of the North. This is a, a wheat-based beer, quite sour, but very low ABV. Hefeweizen, of which more momentarily. And then, of course, the, the brown ales and the stouts, which are very much about the, the malt, and the American pale ales and the India pale ales, uh, which are about the hops. And then we have the imperial stouts, which are about the... Both of them, but they're balanced, they're balanced. And these are big beers uh, to be treated with respect. So Hefeweizen, people always ask me about Hefeweizen. Hefeweizen is breakfast beer. There's a beer for every time of day. So this is what you would have for brunch if you were in Munich. And there are three indicators that you've got an authentic Hefeweizen. The first is it should smell of cloves. And that's because the yeast is an ale yeast, which should be used for making Hefeweizen is a Hefe yeast. It's a special type of ale yeast, which has a gene in it for an enzyme, which gives you a clove, a medicinal-like flavor. The second thing that this yeast does is make a lot of uh, so-called esters, fruity character, banana-like character. Some people uh, call it a bubblegum uh, character. Uh, Dan Gordon makes a wonderful Hefeweizen, Gordon Beersch Hefeweizen. He always refers to it in that way as well. And he learned how to do it as a student in Germany at the world's oldest brewery in Weinstephan. And the third marker for an authentic Hefeweizen is no slice of lemon floating in the top of the beer. Now, uh, we established earlier on that uh, sour beers are, are not your favorite, uh, but uh, many people love them. And uh, the, the classic is uh, the Lambic, the Lambic or Lambic from Belgium, uh, where they have more reverence for beer than any other country in the world. And these are breweries, uh, w which I jokingly say never get clean now, but basically they take advantage of not only brewing yeast, but many, many other yeasts and bacteria, uh, hundreds of them. And some of them are, are listed here. And so they, they are very, very sour. Some people uh, include fruit um, in the uh, things like uh, cherries, in which case you'd have creek or black currants. Uh, oh, sorry, would be uh, creek. Uh, cherries would be uh, uh, framboise. Sorry, I'm getting it all wrong. Raspberries would be framboise. Um, anyway, peaches, pêche, pombe for apples. Um, uh, and uh, they're very sour, but they can, this will cover over that, uh, that uh, sourness. One of the organisms is Brettanomyces. Brettanomyces was named in honor of the British uh, because back in the day, uh, the very first pure yeast were uh, developed by um, uh, Emil Christian Hansen in Copenhagen, working for Carlsberg. And uh, once he showed how you could get a pure form of uh, Saccharomyces, it went all the way around the world. And everybody wanted to use pure yeast, apart from the British. They insisted 
they needed a second yeast to condition the beer. So in honor of the British, they called it Breton or Macy's. Uh, and uh, it's an organism championed by our very good friend, Mr. Vinny Chilezo at the Russian River Brewing Company with his sour beers, not his pale ales. You'll have heard of his famous Pliny the Elder and Pliny the Younger, note the pronunciation. But he also has his, uh, what he calls his funky beers, his sour beers. And uh, he's very proud of those. And uh, he loves this quote, if used properly with care, it can add rich aromas and flavors of earthiness, leather, smoke, barnyard, and our favorite descriptor, wet dog in a phone booth. So that's what Breton or Mises can do for you. Uh, it's uh, horses for courses. Now beer doesn't like light. And uh, if beer is exposed to light, it develops the delicious aroma of the skunk. And this is why most brewers putting beer into bottles will package into brown glass. The wavelengths of light that cause the skunking are this low range here, 400 to 500 nanometers. And you can see that light absorption by the brown glass is pretty much complete. So the light doesn't get in. It will to a slight extent. That's why even with brown glass bottle, you shouldn't leave it exposed to the light. But green glass and clear glass bottles just let the light in. And what happens is the light is captured by a vitamin called riboflavin, which transfers the energy over to the bitter substances and they break down to give the skunky flavor. Now you uh, will not get a skunky Miller, even though they use clear glass bottles. And that's because Miller for the longest time have used chemically modified hops uh, that do not break down to give uh, the skunky character. Some of the flavors that come from the yeast are, are shown here. Uh, the first of these is a so-called popcorn flavor. This is due to a substance called diacetyl. Uh, diacetyl, uh, I hate this aroma. This keeps me out of movie theaters, um, but it's due to uh, the diacetyl, which is produced naturally during fermentation. Uh, however, the yeast removes it again. And for most beers, you want that to happen. So you have to leave the yeast and the beer together long enough for this diacetyl to be removed. You can get diacetyl also from bacteria that will contaminate uh, the dispense lines in the bar. So if you've got a beer that smells of butterscotch or popcorn, the strong chances are that uh, the, the uh, publican, the landlord, the bar staff are not cleaning the dispense lines properly. And that's why personally, I'm not a big fan of bars having too many beers on tap. We talked about uh, the banana flavor, the isoamyl malacetate earlier on. Uh, that can be produced by pretty much all yeast. Uh, Hefeweizen produces a particularly large amount. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, eggs, you might say, uh, don't like the idea of that in beer, but I invite you to travel when you can travel to Burton-on-Trent, England. You'll find that the draft ale in Burton-on-Trent has got a distinct eggy character. And that's because the yeast uh, makes the hydrogen sulfide from the very high levels of sulfate that are present in the water. And then finally, I'd mention the canned corn flavor, dimethyl sulfide. This is a flavor that's associated with some lager beers, particularly if you go to somewhere like Germany, there's a lot of DMS. You want to smell it in a beer in this country, try Rolling Rock Lager. Rolling Rock is loaded with DMS. Um, when I was with Bass, I wrote the control document with Roy Parsons for how we would control the DMS level, the dimethyl sulfide level in Carling Black Label. Because we always wanted a little bit of DMS to give a nice lagery character, but not too much. That brand, of course, these days is owned by Molson Coors. Now, beer ages. Um, if I was a wine person, I, I would not use these words. But, but what we say is that it develops a sort of a wet cardboard um, or wet paper and Tomcat flavor. If I was a wine person, I would, I would say, oh, I'm getting a, 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 a moist parchment character and a feline note. Uh, but we don't. We, we talk about this in, uh, in all honesty. A beer ages. Uh, most beers, a few beers will improve. And so if you go to, uh, when you're allowed back into the bars at uh, somewhere like Sierra Nevada, you can do a vertical tasting of the Bigfoot barley wine and see how it's changed over time because up at 10% ABV, some of the changes taking place are interesting and positive ones, but most beer is not. So uh, the big enemy of beer is 
oxygen. And so we, a brewer goes out of the way to minimize the amount of oxygen which is present in the beer during packaging. But if you've got beer in bottles, the oxygen creeps between the neck of the bottle and the crown cork, the crown cap. So uh, air is continually creeping into a beer in a bottle. It can't do that in a can. Um, and that is why beer is more stable in a can than it is in a bottle. A lot of people say to me, oh, beer in a can has got a metallic flavor. No, it doesn't, because the can and the lid are lacquered, they're coated, and they don't give a metallic flavor at all. So like it or not, beer has actually uh, have got longer stability in a can than it has in a bottle. The other important thing is temperature. The more, the higher the temperature which you store the beer, the more rapidly it will age. Now I teach in degrees Celsius, the, apart from one country in the world, the brewing industry uses degrees centigrade or Celsius. Anyway, I, I've taken pity, I've got Fahrenheit here. So if you're at room temperature, classic room temperature, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, then it's probably about a hundred days uh, shelf life before the beer has uh, got too much of a cardboard or Tomcat P flavor. Um, look at a bottle of Bud. Uh, or Bud Light, and it's got a born on date on it. That's the date's packaged, and it'll say uh, to consume it within 110 days. They're assuming you're going to be storing it at room temperature. Now, if you have your beer at uh, 86 um, degrees Fahrenheit, you've got 33 days, you've got about a month. If you're at 104 Fahrenheit, my garage in, in Davis is comfortably that in the middle of summer, then it's just 11 days. If you go as high as uh, uh, 50 or 122 Fahrenheit. Uh, we used to ship beer, uh, alcohol free beer from Bass to Saudi Arabia, and it would sit on the dock side at that sort of temperature three to four days. And if you're up at uh, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you better drink it down quick. But if you drop the temperature down to 50 Fahrenheit, you got 300 days to a first approximation. It's a guideline. And if you're down at uh, uh, 32, then your beer is going to last a long time. In other words, buy just the amount you need. Make sure you look at the, the, the shelf life on the package. Um, ideally, it'll be a born on date or a packaging date. That's what you'll get on a Sierra Nevada beer and store it cold, store it cold. Foam, they call me the Pope of Foam. It's very, very important. Uh, you get a stable foam on beer because there are proteins that come from the grain and their bitter substances come from the hops and they stick together in the bubble wall and hold it together. And uh, this is why, another reason you should pour the beer in a glass so you can admire this, and as the foam, the stable foam, as you drink the beer, it will adhere to the side of the beer glass and clip. Um, but you've got to pour with vigor. Look at that, even a beer label from Sudwork has got my name on it, pour with vigor, which means that you've got to release the bubbles. If you pour really gently down the side of a, of a glass, then you're not going to produce the foam. So you've got to pour with vigor to release the carbon dioxide to produce the bubbles in the first place. And you've got to have a clean glass. This is a sign of a dirty glass. Look at these dirty bubbles on the side. This is not clean. This is a sign of grease and, uh, and, and dirt. This is a glass that has not been cleaned properly. You've got to clean your glasses properly. You do the glasses first in the sink, nothing else. In the sink, you put your glasses in there with hot water and washing up detergent, wash the glasses thoroughly inside and out, rinse away the detergent with clean water and let them drain dry. And then if you want to test whether they're clean or not, sprinkle salt over the inner surface. If your beer glass is clean, that salt will coat the entire inner surface. I once was teaching a class, a one week class on campus and a guy came from um, uh, Austin, Texas, and he looked like this. And I said, uh, you got to get rid of that hideous growth because great globules of grease are going to swing on the whiskers and drip into the beer and kill the foam. And next day, he uh, gone, absolutely gone. Uh, and I said, whoops. He said, yep. He said, I'm married 15 years. And my wife has never seen me clean shaven before. A week later, he wrote to me, he said, dear Charlie, my wife is not talking to me. My children don't know who I am, but the foam is fantastic. Um, you can have too much foam, that's called gushing. It may be because you've dropped the beer or some idiot shaken your beer, but it could be due to contaminated grain used by the brewer 
and a small protein that comes from fusarium contaminating the grain, uh, which will cause the beer to gush. We don't want that. Finally, in the last couple of minutes available to me, I'd just like to talk about beer and health. This is a, a lithograph from William Hogarth uh, depicting Beer Street and what a scene of great plenty and abundance there was when people drank beer. But when people drank gin, uh, this is the debauchery and uh, the wickedness that was all around. If you go back to the previous, you see that the only business that's not being run is the port broker, the port broker side is falling away. But here, they're doing a good business as people pawn things to get money for drinking gin. I, I like gin these days, but the point is beer is healthier. Now, the, the people poo-poo this idea, but there's been so many studies over the years showing this U or J-shaped curve between the relationship between the risk of death and alcohol consumption. So moderate, modest consumption of beer, perhaps one or two beers, regular strength beers, not the end of history beers, um, per day um, will actually reduce the risk, particularly risk of coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, cuts down the risk of accumulation of bad cholesterol. Well, people say to me, well, surely uh, wine drinkers are healthier. Well, they probably have a healthier lifestyle. But there's far more nutritional value in beer than there is in uh, wine. A uh, beer contains some B vitamins, a uh, beer contains soluble fiber, beer contains uh, various minerals, particularly silica. Uh, beer is the richest source of silica in the diet. This cuts down the risk of osteoporosis. Um, so beer actually in moderation is good for you. Now people talk about the beer belly, that's a myth. Um, as long as you count the calories, and remember the main source of calories in any alcoholic beverage is the alcohol. And as long as you're accounting for that in your calorie intake, and as long as you're burning off more calories than you take in, then you will not get a beer belly. So a little bit of safe, uh, completely shameless self-promotion. Uh, there is a great course, one of the great courses that uh, we did on beer, and my most recent book, In Praise of Beer. So uh, with that, I will uh, take your questions. Thank you. What a lot of great information, Charles. I'm sure uh, everyone's probably thirsty for a Friday afternoon beverage now. We have a few questions here. The first one is, does the addition of nitrogen to a beer bottle extend the shelf life? No, the amounts of, you, first of all, the, the, you wouldn't probably put nitrogen into a bottle, uh, into a can, certainly. Uh, nitrogen is not very soluble. Um, so, um, but uh, it's primarily there to influence the palate, but especially the foam. Um, nitrogen may be used as what we call an undercover gas on canning to sweep away uh, some of the oxygen. So to the extent that it can actually uh, get rid of some of the oxygen prior to packaging, then it, 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 it will be helpful, yes. Okay. So somebody says they went to uh, street cafes in Spain and had some beer uh, that was uh, draft beers and wanted to know why they tasted so good, which sounds like a personal question, but maybe you have <laughs> something further to answer there. Well, I, I, I personally uh, like my, my draft beers, but as long as they're fresh. So when I go back to my native England, um, I, I go into a pub and I want to have the hand pumped beer. And if it's young and, and uh, newly uh, tapped, it's delicious. Uh, but if you're not careful, it will turn to vinegar pretty quickly. Um, and um, so it can be bad. Uh, in terms of stability of the product, uh, as I've said, can is best, then bottle. Unless the, the bar staff know what they're doing, then uh, the beer uh, on tap can go bad pretty quickly. If you've got too many beers on tap, then if some of them are not moving and um, being served as rapidly as possible, then they will age in the keg. A number of years ago, I was interviewing the San Francisco uh, Chronicle uh, Sunday Supplement, and they said, you go into a bar, there's 30 beers on tap. Which one are you going to choose? And I said, one in a bottle, because those 30 beers aren't being served fast enough. Okay. So someone says, I've heard that there's a movement away from hoppy beers. Is that true? And if so, why? <laughs> There's all sorts of movements. Um, hop, uh, hoppy beers are still very, very popular. And of course, uh, the beers in, in uh, North America uh, developed, uh, the, so the IPAs and the pale ales in the United States, far, far hoppier than the beer ever was before. 
the traditional English IPAs were never as hoppy as that. They were in bitterness, but not in terms of hoppy nose. Um, but people are experimenting all the time. People are trying all sorts of things. There are lots of brewers that have gone into uh, alcoholic um, teas and um, alcohol uh, seltzers uh, and these sorts of things, which personally, I, I personally am not a fan of. But all the time, people are looking for new angles, new opportunities. Uh, and some of them are retro. Some of them are going back to some of the beers that um, were long ago. Personally, when I first came to this country, it's a famous story. I met with Ken Grossman of Sierra Nevada. I said, Ken, your beers are about as hoppy as I can take them. And he said, you know, 30 years ago, I was brewing in a bucket. Now I'm brewing hundreds of thousands of barrels every year. Can I leave it alone? I said, go for it, Ken. But now the beers that he, he had then are not as hoppy as the, I would like them. I like them even hoppier now. So he, the hops grow on you. Okay, so the next question is also about hops. Um, are the hops from Tasmania markedly different from those of Washington and Europe? Yeah, hops. Uh, there's a lot of interest in using hops from all over the world. Uh, so uh, Tasmania, but also New Zealand. Uh, there's a lot of interest in hops from there. And they are different into the extent that they are different varieties. And um, there's a, a huge range of um, uh, spectra of flavors for the oils that come from the different hops. So the, the different varieties have got uh, uh, very different uh, hop aromas. And just like uh, people talk about the grapes and the varietals of the grapes, we can do exactly the same thing with, with hops. So um, as long as the, the thing about a hop is it deteriorates quite quickly. So uh, a lot of people love the fresh hop beers, the wet hop beers with, with newly picked hops. And you, you make your, just like the crush in the world of wine, you make your beer right from the, right the get-go with the fresh hops. But if you want to store hops for any length of time, if you don't want them to go cheesy, you've got to store them airtight and you've got to store them cold. And so that of itself leads to some challenges if you want to ship beers from the uh, hops from the Antipodes. Someone has asked, how should a beer glass be dried? I've heard face down on a towel with no circulation is bad. Is that true or false? No, that's not bad. It's good. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, wor the worst thing of all is, is to have a greasy, a dirty old dishcloth and, and you wipe it with that. And, it, and just as bad is if you carry your glasses with your, you know, five glasses in each his hand with your fingers in each and that's dreadful because the grease uh, of your fingers. So the, whatever you do, you don't want to introduce any oils, any fats, whether it's from food or fingers or mustaches or lipstick or, or any of those things. Um, so as long as it's a clean cloth, and you're not getting grease around the rim, um, then uh, whatever you stand it on, make sure that uh, as long as there's no opportunity to pick up any uh, oils and, and, and fats, that's what you want. Great. So um, someone's asked, how are light beers made and low carb beers? Are they better for your health? <laughs> um, well, uh, the, certainly uh, in terms of, if, if we're talking about light needs different things in different places. So light beers, low carb beers, as the name would suggest, low carb, they are a few, lower in, in carbohydrates. Um, so uh, one way to make these sorts of products is to add uh, an extra enzyme. So when you, ex when you break down the, the, the starch in regular beers, you break down about 80% of the starch to sugars, but about 20% of the starch is left behind. We call it dextrins. These are small carbohydrates that uh, aren't fermented. So they get into the beer. If you put the extra enzyme in there, you convert all of the starch into uh, eventually into alcohol. So you get more alcohol, which of itself is more calories. So what the brewer does then is thin it out by adding some extra water to lower the alcohol content. And they won't lower it to exactly the same alcohol concentration as the regular product, but still lower. Um, so what that means is you get a substantial amount of, uh, of thinness in the product. So um, do they contain less carbohydrate? Yes, they, they're lower carb. Are they healthier? Well most of them will not contain as much vitamins or fiber or all the other good things, silica, as the regular beers. And of course, it's, it's actually the alcohol, which is the key uh, common denominator in, uh, in those beverages that 
uh, counter atherosclerosis. The wine guys, um, I, I like to say they stole the moral high ground saying that it, it's red wine, which is the healthiest. Uh, it, no, because to drink enough red wine to get enough of the magic ingredient they talk about, resveratrol, you need over 100 bottles of wine a day. Um, so, um, so actually, it's the alcohol, which is probably of all the components of the beer, uh, at once the, the healthiest thing and the least healthy thing if you abuse it. Um, so, um, so it's not a simple thing to say low carb or diet beers or low calorie beers uh, are light beers are healthier. Great. Okay. So are you saying that beer tastes better when you pour it vigorously to make foam? No, it, 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 well, psychologically, <laughs> no, you pour with, you pour with vigor to actually release the bubbles. I hate it when I go into a bar and they pour it really gently. What are you doing? You know, because you're not producing the foam. And we've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work over um, 42 years um, to, to demonstrate that uh, people are actually influenced by the appearance of the beer. And I can tell you, when I was a quality assurance manager for a time with the Bass Brewing Company, the, the first thing people complained about was that there was no head on the beer. And if you, you've got to work hard to put the head on there and also to keep it there. So keeping it there is primarily a case of clean glasses, but getting it there, it's very much a case of a good, vigorous dispense. Now, you don't want to go berserk and have it cascading over the top of the glass. But if you've got a bottle, you've got a glass or a can, pour it with vigor, put a, produce a lot of foam, let it settle, keep topping it up, topping it up, and then you will have a product which is going to delight you. Okay. So what level or type of malt is used in producing Irish Killian's Red? Any idea whether the formulation changed when Coors bought them out? I don't, I think, I, I, I may be wrong on this, but I think Killian's was actually invented by Coors. I don't think it was, I don't think there was a brand in, in Ireland called Killian's. I may be wrong on that, but I think it, it's, uh, it's an Irish. In, indeed, if you go to Ireland, I, 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 you know, it's very much about the, the, the stouts. Um, um, Killian's Red, they will have a goodly proportion of some of the more strongly uh, kilned malts, the, the darker caramel malts, then probably is a little bit of, of uh, something like a chocolate malt in there, but not as much that's going to give you the roasted character. But they would, uh, they'll be containing quite a lot of caramel malt. But in that beer, just like every other, the main one, even for Guinness, the main grist component is always a pale malt because you need those enzymes to break down the starch. Someone's asked, do you know why they stopped growing hops locally? I know there used to be a lot out by a Slough House whenever you drive out. Yeah, Slough House was the last sizable um, uh, hop garden in the area. I think basically just because they, the, A, they, they found they could make a better living growing other things, and B, they were simply outclassed by the sheer size of the business up in Yakima in Washington State. And um, so I think it's, it's simply, uh, you know, they, they, as, as, as businesses, they were out, outmaneuvered, should we say, the, from the guys up in Washington State. Do uh, breweries ever add essential oils or other artificial ingredients? Um, some some brew, there's, there's beers that actually include all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, interesting items and, and uh, uh, not, not everybody aff approves of them. There is a beer from Colorado that includes Rocky Mountain oysters. There's no end to the, uh, some people would say stupidity, uh, but others say uh, ingenuity of, of, uh, of brewers. So yeah, uh, some brewers uh, uh, play some pretty strange tunes. Very good. Thank you so much, Charles. I think that's about all the time we have today. Our, the last comment we got from somebody is asking if you've ever thought of doing stand-up comedy. So apparently you were entertaining as well as informative. I have been roasted in the comedy club in Sacramento. Too. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yes, bye. We'll go back to our MC now. Thank you very much, Dr. Bamford, for the very interesting presentation on beer. I am feeling rather thirsty right now. Um, as a reminder, this presentation has been recorded and it will be available for viewing later on the Renaissance YouTube channel. And a reminder about next Friday's forum, we will have Dr. Landsberg with a very, very appropriate and timely topic, voting rights then and now. Make sure you register by Friday at 12 p.m. to attend.
Thank you very much for attending our forum today.